Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 118, A Little Coco with your Philhar Magic. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my allegedly rested and refreshed co-host, Michelle Whalen. Sure, we'll go with that. How you doing today, dear? I am fantabulous, and you? I'm I'm great. So we had two long weeks off, unexpectedly. We had kind of planned on doing podcast last week, but yeah, kind of scratched that <laughs> idea. Um, we did do some upgrades to mm-hmm. the studio in the process. None that you can see. <laughs> uh, that's not true. I do have my third oh, okay. uh, utility <laughs> monitor up here. Okay, and we have the new stand for the. Sure. The mixer there. So you'll also notice we have a couple of uh, slightly changed camera angles. Mm-hmm. We moved our cameras around a bit because they were a little low. Uh, did a little bit of rewiring. I did want to do some changing, some uh, re tiling of the walls with <laughs> the acoustic, didn't and that, that yeah. didn't happen. Yeah. So uh, that's probably something we'll do in a December break or a a winter break because it was a little too warm to be working in here for True. too long. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once I got all the wiring done, I was <laughs> you were like, I was nope, spent. I am done. <laughs> I was spent. But we did take a couple of weeks off. We are back. We have lots of uh, news to talk about uh, in our Disney detective today. We're going to talk about Imagineer Tom Fitzgerald going behind the scenes on making the new Coco scene for Mickey's Philhar Magic. And did you ever want to spend a night in the Haunted Mansion? Nope. Ne- never. Never. No. I well, would. No. Mm-mm. We're going to tell you how to make it happen. <laughs> Just come to our house. No. Exactly. <laughs> then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Mark Hamill says he's secretly been in every Star Wars movie since 2015. And Grogu and Luke build a lightsaber at Disney when they go to... Galaxy's, Galaxy's Edge. Edge and they <laughs> make it, they go through. Yeah, that, that's, that's not, not it. No, no. that's not it. <laughs> One can hope. Yeah, well. And in our entertainment news, a decades old Walking Dead lawsuit has ended in a settlement. Big shocker there. Mm, yeah. But it hasn't really ended though. Plus, why didn't Loki use the void popularized by the Mandalorian's production crew to do their production? Mm-hmm. Interesting story there. Yep. Then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and some afterthoughts. But before we do that, I would invite our listeners and our viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as insights into things. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into entertainment. We're available on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, etc., etc., uh, we would also invite you to give us your feedback. We are looking to take viewer feedback and hopefully incorporate it into the show in some way, but certainly looking for topics or just tell us what we're doing wrong and to stop doing it. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast on Instagram, which we Occasionally, monthly, maybe post on there. We're at Instagram.com slash Insights Into Things, where you can get links to everything on our main website at www.insightsintothings.com. Ready to get started? Sure. All right, here we go. (laughs) That's the wrong camera angle, by the way. Oh. I'm a little out of practice. (laughs) Go for this. Hey, everybody. (laughs) Uh, it's okay. 
Um, so this was an interesting little story that was popping up um, most of most of uh, last week. Was talking about how um, they are adding a new scene to the Mickey's Philhar Magic attraction at the Disney parks. So Disney has shared a new behind the scenes look at creating the new animated scene based on Disney and Pixar's Coco that is coming to Mickey's Philhar Magic this year at Walt Disney World's uh, Magic Kingdom. So Imagineer Tom Fitzgerald uh, explained some of the process that went into creating the first new scene for the 3D show in almost 20 years. The musical number... Un Poco Loco will anchor the new scene when it opens to guests at Disney's California Adventure Park and Disneyland Paris on July 17th, before being added to Magic Kingdom Park later this year during Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary celebration. So according to Disney, this is the first time that Disney and Pixar animators have actually worked together on a creative endeavor where characters from both animated studios will actually be seen together on screen. The film's original composer, Jermaine Franco, uh, has produced a unique Coco score for the new scene in Mickey's Philhar Magic. Um, now, don't, don't get upset. No scenes will actually be cut to make room for the new scene. They're actually just adding it on in addition to the other scenes from the movie. So this is kind of cool that they're doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, and a couple big things. One, your first time you're seeing Disney and Pixar characters together. Right, because Donald Duck is going to be interacting right. with the characters from Coco. Now, they're from obviously Coco. different animation styles. Mm-hmm. How do you think that's going to blend together? Well, well, if you remember from watching Mickey's Philhar Magic, it's done in the computer-generated version. So they upgrade all of the older Disney classics that are part of it into the more um, uh, uh, computer generated version of right. things. So sorry, the rain comes like, <laughs> what is that? It's rain and our daughter's at band camp. Awesome. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Anyway. So, so that's, what's nice about it is that they don't take um, you know, like Aladdin, the original Aladdin, and take this computer generated version of Donald Duck and try and put it together. They upgraded when they started so making Phil Armand. Right. The they hand drawn animation. They redid a lot of it so it matches. So I'm sure it's probably gonna you know, look like Donald should have been in Coco. Right. Making sure that's not her. Yeah. <laughs> Just making sure. I'm like, oh, okay, we gotta go pick up our kid. <laughs> um, so, so they're adding it on. They're not shortening, right? The scene and that's at all. what's kind of nice too. Nope, that wasn't her. Um, so that's what's kind of nice too, because there are some times when, uh, when they do sort of updates, um, like to fill, um, not fill her magic, uh, to, because fill her magic is what we're talking about, to Fantasmic. When they had the original version of Fantasmic, and then they did the the newer version for Florida, they changed certain right, scenes. Right. So you know, so if you well, wanted it's a completely different venue well, too, right? It's done in a completely different venue, but you have you know Pocahontas is kind of the main theme of one, and Peter Pan is kind of the main theme of the other. Right. So they didn't add it they just changed it so again a lot of times when they do these modifications they sometimes take something out to put something in same thing with parades that you know when they update they don't make it longer they take something out so this was kind of nice that they left it the same so now if you go you're not looking to see what they took away you're getting that added something at the end so now mickey's philhar magic is a 4d movie are they incorporating 4d elements into this segment do you know i didn't hear anything so that'll be kind of a surprise that would be interesting you know to and now they're doing this at disneyland first right so they were doing it at disneyland uh, well, actually, Disney's California Adventure Park and then Disneyland Paris. So it'll actually start there July 17th. So it already passed, I guess, because 
It's the it's 20th. It's July 17th. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what hard, day. I, know. Whew, I don't know what day it is. You know, that's what happens when you're on a vacation. You kind of lose all sense of, right. of time and space. Um, but that it'll be coming to the Magic Kingdom in Florida later on for okay. the 50th anniversary. Cool. Tell us about how we can stay a night at the Hornet Mansion. So this was a, a cool article that, again, was popping up in, in various different spots. So, of course, when it comes to decorating your home with top-notch Disney merchandise, fans go all out when sporting their favorite memorabilia in their homes. Now, however, it's a whole other ball game when you want to transform your house into <clears throat> a popular attraction, especially the Haunted Mansion. I know nothing about that. <laughs> oh, wait, I do, because our living room is all Haunted Mansion. So one Airbnb owner has now converted his rentable home into the Haunted Mansion like no other fan, and it happens to be a short drive from Disneyland. So unfortunately, we're a little far from it. Um, so a massive Disney Parks fan uh, has converted his Orange County, California, four-bedroom, two-bath home into the a perfect recreation of Disneyland's Haunted Mansion. Uh, he had said, um, you know, in the past, um, you know, most guests kind of do one or two bedrooms, but he actually took it to the next level and did every room of the house. So the official page of this haunted mansion inspired Airbnb states that leave the world of the living behind and cross over at least for a few nights uh, to this ghoulish, delightful haunted mansion inspired and frightfully immersive treat. You and your loved ones will encounter a plethora of haunted mansion replicas Ghost, ghostly illusions and sights and sounds that will make you feel like you are truly spending a night in Disney's haunted mansion. Um, so just looking at, at some of these pictures um, from it, it looks amazing. It looks like a Disney, uh, in, you know, version hotel, you know, that Disney would have done. Um so they have various different suites. There's um, the Master Gracie room, which has a California king bed, the Madame Leota room, uh, which has a queen bed, Hatbox ghost room, uh, two queen beds, and then the Ravens room, which has two twin beds. Um, so, you know, it offers uh, free Wi-Fi and a washer and dryer and, you know, all the amenities that you would expect. Um, the the other thing is, you know, like the, the stretching uh, portrait room is a game room. So they have that. They have a pet cemetery out back. Um, they do have various sights and sounds that if you're having trouble sleeping at night, they can turn off. So I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, to, to put as a, as a different plug, you know, we can, you know, we can turn it off. Um, so looks really cool. Um, at the moment, the nightly rates are going for $572 per night. But if you're splitting the cost amongst five or six people, then you're staying for about a hundred dollars a night and it, and it sleeps, you know, obviously if you, you take up the whole area, you know, you, you can sleep at least, you know, at least six people, maybe even more. So very cool looking. Very cool. I mean, I can only imagine how much something like this costs to, to Oh, decorate. just to decorate it. Yeah. I'd like to reach out to him and find out like where he got his wallpaper from, mm. because that's one of the things that we've been trying to find right. that we can affordably do here. Right. And um, that's one of the things whenever you, you know, because I'm part of a bunch of different Haunted Mansion Facebook fan groups and everybody always, you know, whenever they wallpaper anything, it's always like the bathroom right. or some small so corner small because area. nobody ever, because to buy the wallpaper, um, you know, is just so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. expensive. So. But like even, even this room here, the, oh, the yeah. portrait room. You know, where you have the digital versions of, of the, the changing, the changing portraits. portraits. That's still cool. You know, yeah. and you've got the bus built mm -hmm. into the wall. Yep. Like it's just the level of detail that mm -hmm. they went to oh, yeah. On, yeah. on some of the things that they had here was just incredible. Yeah. So if anybody, you know, that's listening, you know, goes to it or, or you know, please reach out to us and, and let us know because I'd love to, you know, see some more uh, behind the scenes 
uh, photos and, and experiences, um, you know, from it. So. And honestly, for 542 or whatever it was a night to spend a night there. Yeah, it's, it's worth it. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, you'd be like roaming the halls and, and you know, speaking of the halls, we even have the breathing <laughs> doors with spirits trying to get out. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. that that that's just, you know, again, that's for anybody that's a haunted mansion fan and would love to just spend a night in the haunted mansion this is obviously the next best thing yeah very cool very cool cool article mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, holy moly, where's that coming from? We'll fix that in post. <laughs> Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. <laughs> so it seems uh, that Mark Hamill says that he's secretly been in every Star Wars movie since 2015. So everybody knows that Mark Hamill is in Star Wars, unless you only... He is? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you've been living under a rock. Um, and then what's funny is in the article it says, or you know him from the Batman animated series, your mind just might have been blown because now you found out that, you know, the Joker is also Luke Skywalker. So again, unless you didn't already know. And he plays such a good Joker, too. Oh, he does. He really does. Um, so now, did you also know that he was in a lot of other Star Wars movies? So yeah, obviously we know that he's played Luke Skywalker in a majority of the films. But what, you know, kind of came out, um, you know, that was uh, kind of revealed was actually prompted by a tweet from some other Star Wars, um, it says in the article, a Star Wars nerd who was doing some archiving work in the Wikipedia and noted that Mark Hamill had provided the voice of the bartender from the mandalorian um the bartender droid ev99 well then mark hamill actually responded by saying that he's actually had multiple secret voice cameos in every star wars movie that's been released since 2015 which covers all of the disney movies even the ones that luke skywalker is not in so Disney and Disney-owned studios have a pattern of selecting voice actors who are kind of good luck charms and putting them in every movie. Just like Alan Tudyk um, does for Disney animation. He's basically in uh, every Disney animated movie since I don't even remember, you know, how far back. And obviously John Ratzenberg, uh, John Ratzenberger is in every Pixar movie that comes out. And that's been since every Pixar movie has come out. So now it seems that Mark Hamill is kind of the uh, Lucasfilms version of the voice actor who's in every, <laughs> every movie. Um, so who are these, you know, other secret characters? Uh, so Wikipedia knows about a couple of the named aliens in the sequel movies, but those definitely aren't the secret ones. And the page actually says nothing about him being in Solo or Rogue One. But obviously someone needs to sit down and kind of watch all of them and try and figure out. <laughs> as painful as that might be. Yeah, that's the whole thing is who's 
there might be a few people that would want to. Who's a glutton for punishment? <laughs> to, um, but then again, you know, which character is it? You know, is it, are you listening for a Luke Skywalker voice or are you listening for a Joker voice? So, you know, there's a good chance that you heard him and you didn't even know yeah. that it was him. Um, so he, so Mark Hamill actually offered a couple of hints a while back explaining that any Star Wars character played by Patrick Williams is actually him. But it seems like he's actually just mentioned it, mentioned in the credits without saying who he actually plays. Um, so the only solution is to just watch everything and try and listen and, and figure out if it's him or not. So Well, this doesn't really surprise me all that much, given the number of cameos that have been happening in the Star Wars movies themselves. Right. Everyone in the brother is getting a cameo. Even the 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 um Heir to the yeah, throne Prince Harry, of or was it both of them? Bo- were both of the brothers were right, and they were all uncredited right. cameos for right. the most part. So, so this doesn't surprise me right. because of the number of cameos that are being done, and it doesn't surprise me because of all the different voices he's capable of right. doing. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and, and he does it uncredited just as you know, just to be a to, good sport, right? And just to be like, hey, I'm an Easter egg in it, you know? Yeah, the fact that you know Kathleen Kennedy keeps him involved in all these things, I think, mm-hmm. is a great tribute to him. You know, as the legacy that he's brought to the franchise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So kind of a cool yeah. cool reward you get there. So to keep on with the Luke theme, um, so it seems that Grogu and Luke are part of an official uh, Comic-Con at home exclusive poster. So although The Mandalorian Season 3 has yet to confirm a release date, a new Comic-Con poster teasing what's in store for Grogu and uh, and Luke. An official licensed poster based on The Mandalorian has been released that depicts Luke Skywalker and Grogu building a lightsaber. And no, they didn't go down to Disney to to, to do it. But it would have been so that, much easier if they did that. <laughs> that would have been cool. Um, so The Mandalorian Season 2 obviously concluded at the end of last year, bringing an end to the season filled to the brim with cameos, Easter eggs uh, for all the Star Wars fans. And while the studio has yet to confirm a concrete release date for the show's third season, there are reports that season three is actually currently filming right now. Um, So obviously, if you watched The Mandalorian and you saw the season three uh, I'm sorry, the season two finale, very action packed. The last few minutes you had the Mandalorian with, you know, him handing off baby Yoda to Luke Skywalker to basically be trained in the force. Um, you know, obviously fans were very excited to see a young Skywalker in action once again. Um, you know, so where does this all go f- from here is what everybody wants to know. But Shop Trends had unveiled the Comic-Con at home exclusive wall poster that shows, um, you know, the two of them uh, working on a lightsaber. So does that mean that we're going to see a little bit more of that? That would be kind of cool if that's like some sort of Christmas, you know, toy that comes out. That'd be kind of cool. That would be kind of cool. You know. So obviously Luke's cameo was possible, you know, thanks to Disney's patented de-aging technology, which now has been used across several of their franchises, including Tron, the MCU, and obviously Star Wars. Um, So while everybody was kind of, you know, happy to see him, now people are wondering, is he going to be part of more in the future? So. Well, on a, on a side note with mm-hmm. that, there was a story in The Verge that I, I stuck in here, and it'll be in our show notes when we publish them, uh, about a deep fake that was created f- based on the de-aging scene of Luke mm-hmm. uh, by YouTuber Shamrock. And he went through and de-aged uh, Luke again with a deep fake that made him look even more realistic and and. Um, more lifelike mm-hmm. and apparently Disney got a hold of this and liked it so much that they actually gave him a job produced as I forget I didn't write down what his title was but like his job is like facial reconstruction or something like that that's now cool that's in, cool in their in their studio now so kind of a cool little mm-hmm. offshoot to this that that turned into a career yeah. move for someone which was really cool yeah very cool 
So uh, that was all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Yep. We'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. <laughs> I was impressed that it wasn't so loud and, you know. <laughs> I, ha I have a slider over here to adjust the volume. So Thanks. I, can, Thanks. I appreciate that. I can do it that. on the fly. Everything doesn't have to be fixed in post. <laughs> That's awesome. So after nearly a decade, Frank uh, Darabont's uh, Walking Dead lawsuit has now ended with a $200 million settlement. Phew. Thank goodness. I feel so much better now. Yeah, it had a real effect on my <laughs> life, too. Well, and what's really kind of funny is the person that wrote this article, which came from uh, avclub.com, he obviously had, like, no love for the guy at all. Um, so he goes on to talk about, you know, it may be difficult to remember at this point, but there was a time when AMC's The Walking Dead was a really good show, specifically during the majority of his first season. Um and it wasn't that it was surprisingly good. It was better than it had the right to be. It was legitimately good. So obviously this person is not a fan of the current version of The Walking Dead. Um, but it seemed that apparently the extremely expensive and difficult to make first season um, after the, the first season had ended, AMC and the original showrunner, Frank Darabont, had split uh, they had gone their separate ways. He was actually fired. Um, so they had fired him ahead of the second season of The Walking Dead. And then he, in turn, sued AMC for allegedly forcing him off of the show and for refusing to pay him for what he thought was his share of the show's profits, with the profits growing and growing as the show obviously became more and more of a hit. Um, one of the core issues in the case was that the Walking Dead was AMC's first wholly owned original series, and it both produced and distributed the show. And while this was kind of an industry insider thing, the results of the lawsuit uh, could have had all sorts of huge implications for how profit sharing works in the world where it's increasingly common for show networks and streaming platforms to both produce and distribute their own content. So, you know, for the the average person watching the show, this had no effect on on, you know, anything. It was basically he, you know, kept going back and forth with AMC with this lawsuit for the last, again, 10 years. And they finally basically settled out of court for two hundred million dollars. And now, you know, that's it. And as we know, The Walking Dead, the final season is coming up. The final season is going to be broken up into a couple different versions or, or, or segments. So it's going to be over like the next two years. Um, so again, no change for, for the show, but he's finally, you know, getting payback for, for being fired. Well, and I think it's kind of odd to expect you to continue to get profit sharing from a show that you're no longer involved mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Um, I, you know, had it gone to court, they would have looked at, at the profitability of that mm -hmm. first season and based on all accounts, it wasn't profitable because of how high the production costs mm -hmm. were. And the production costs were that high because of him. Right. 
So if anything, they, he should have had to pay them back. Right, for all any, the money. <laughs> right, from any residuals he was getting from it. Yeah. And then not having a creative hand in the rest of the show should have entitled him to absolutely nothing. Right. So, you know, it's it's one of these things where it's funny how legal things tend to work mm-hmm. themselves out like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can't really get upset or overly interested in right. millionaires arguing over how many right. millions they should have. Right, and that was what was kind of funny because, again, the person that wrote the article had no love for the guy and was like, good for him. Right. Yeah, he got the money, but I wrote a story on it and... Okay. Right. Like he'll that get, was he'll kinda... get a couple bucks for writing a story, and that's right. about it. <laughs> right. So. Not two hundred million dollars. So. Yeah. So. So if you need to borrow any money, he's the guy you go to now. So. <laughs> right. So moving right along, why didn't Loki use the void? Yeah. So this was kind of an interesting story because, again, if you have watched the various Disney Plus shows. And the behind the scene shows that they've done showing how they film it, you would kind of think, oh, Loki probably used it too. And it seems that the production designer uh, revealed why they didn't use um, the technology called the volume. Um, Oh, the volume. I'm sorry. I said the void. Right. Um, So in the AMC's third series, which which follows Loki uh, after he messes with the sacred timeline by stealing stealing the Tesseract during the Avengers time heist in 2012, he gets apprehended by the TVA and he, you know, forms a friendship and a bond with agent mobius um and then they set off on some time traveling adventures where they encounter uh, multiple variants including uh him variants of himself including sylvie um but unlike um marvel's two previous shows wandavision and falcon and the winter soldier loki actually jumped around different points in, in time and space um and what they you know, people presumed was that they had used the volume just like in The Mandalorian. But however, the production designer and his team decided not to use the cutting edge tech, cutting edge technology for the Marvel series because, because it didn't coordinate with their goals. So according to comicbook.com, he had said it just wasn't creatively super relevant for Loki. So now the volume, which is also referred to as Stagecraft LED services, uh, is uh, is essentially a 360 degree virtual set within an indoor soundstage, which was popularized, obviously, by The Mandalorian. Um, So the created uh, V. FX company, Industrial Light and Magic, and the technologies um, with combination of the high-res graphics basically, you know, allow the the background to move a- as the actors are moving. So it's not like a stagnant set. So you can have them, you know, walking across the desert and have it as a, a continuous scene. But it seems that, um, you know, for what they were looking for in Loki, they didn't want to use that, that they actually wanted more traditional practical sets for it. Now, this was something that we actually did get to see when we watched um, the making of special, which is one of the nice things with the Disney Plus shows is after the season's end, they do this behind the scenes um, episode where they they show you various different things. And the one scene they showed was this big giant set that they built because they wanted it to have that 360 look and it was something that they probably wouldn't have been able to capture if they had done it in the void so you could definitely see you know some of the difference but also what's kind of neat is until we saw the stuff about um not the void the volume see you got me saying that so until we saw the behind the scenes stuff of the mandalorian we didn't even know what scenes were done in the volume and and what weren't because that's how seamless it looked so 
Obviously, they didn't use it, but there were obviously, you know, other special effects that they used in the show. Um, so Marvel has clearly spent a lot of time and money on the reality bending series uh, special effects. So while the volume wasn't used for this, obviously, it'll be used for other things in the future. And that's cool. I like the fact that they already have it. They're being used on uh, Thor Love and Thunder. And, yes. You know, they've built four of them around the world. Right. Uh, so clearly they're in high demand. Bef- mm-hmm. Before we get off of this story, though, I did want to – this w- this wasn't the meme that I was looking for. Okay. Um, but it it kind of gets the gist of it. Okay. Hang on a second. So in Loki, you have all these variants, right? So one of the variants happens to be a crocodile Loki. Right. Alligator Loki. <laughs> Alligator, crocodile, whatever. Right, right, yeah. He winds up biting off one of the other variant Loki's hands. Right. So I happen to come across this meme oh, today okay. about a Thanos crossover. Okay. Where, you know, Thor went for the chest. He should have gone for the head. Right. Croc Loki would have gone for the hand. Right. I am and inevitable. You would, you would have gotten... Croaky now. <laughs> you would have gotten okay. Croaky biting the hand off with the Infinity Gauntlet on it, and that would have solved the problem right there. There you go. Okay. So that's a that's an alternate <laughs> universe one we all we're all looking forward to seeing. At okay. Some point in time all right. That's kind of cool. I like that. So, but that was all we had for our mm-hmm. entertainment news this week. Yep. We will be right back with our. Uh, what do we got next? Oh, our insightful, insightful picks, picks of the week. Yeah, I'm a little out of practice. You got to work with me here. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick this week is a new documentary uh, that just aired on Disney Plus, And I was very excited to hear that they were doing this. Um, and now it is available and it is called behind the attraction. So you get to get a peek beyond the magic of Disney parks to discover what's beyond the attraction behind the attraction from executive producers, Dwayne Johnson, uh, Danny Garcia and Brian Vokes Weiss explore how Imagineers filled the haunted mansion with 999 happy haunts, how the twilight zones tower of terror transformed into guardians of the galaxy mission breakout while defying gravity in the process and why space mountain took so long to launch from the 1950s to today from jungle cruise to it's a small world to star wars galaxy's edge disney parks attractions have amazed millions and this is the story of how they did it so it's a very cool documentary it's not one of those boring put you to sleep it's it's definitely meant for oh, you mean the ones i recommend no no i'm not saying that <laughs> some of the ones you watch are funny too well not funny but entertaining um but it's definitely meant for the family to watch uh so there are little things to kind of keep the kids entertained but then there's a you know some inside jokes and different things for you know the adults to kind of laugh at it was kind of done in the style of um the Netflix uh documentaries uh um the the movies that made us or the toys that made us so that you know tongue in cheek um uh, aspect again to kind of keep it keep it going um we've watched four of the six episodes so far um and it's neat because they don't just talk about the one attraction um they kind of give you a little background because when they talk about the jungle cruise they talk about how the whole idea of the park came to be and how they created the jungle cruise and then how they did the jungle cruise in other versions of the park and and how they modified it same thing with the haunted mansion it was okay we're we know we're going to do a haunted mansion and if Again, if you're a fan of certain things, you already know a lot of the backstory, you know, because the Haunted Mansion was supposed to originally kind of go in this direction and then it went in that direction. And then the idea of, okay, how do we bring it to each park and how do we modify it? Do we keep it the same? Do we change it? Um, You know, and that was the other thing that was kind of interesting with Tower of Terror was once they created the ride technology, they enhanced it for other parks, 
But then when they brought it to Tokyo, they had to completely change the story around because nobody in Tokyo knew about Twilight Zone. So it's interesting to see how they, you know, take the one idea and it kind of gets morphed into all these other ideas where they're able to use them, you know, uh, and and bring them to life in all of the, the parks in various ways. So very cool. Looking forward to seeing the rest of the series. And I think there's possibly going to be a second set of uh, shows that come out because I remember that there were supposed to be some other um, episode, so I don't know if it's that because they dropped all six at once. So I don't know if maybe in a year from now they're doing more. I'll have to you know look it up and and find out more. But as of right now, there's six episodes available, all on Disney Plus. Cool pick. Thank you. So my pick this week, lo and behold, is not a documentary. My pick is actually Black Widow on Disney+. Plus. In Marvel Studios' action-packed spy thriller Black Widow, Natasha Romanoff, a.k.a. Black Widow, confronts the darker parts of her ledger when a dangerous conspiracy with ties to her past arises. Pursued by a force that will stop at nothing to bring her down, although clearly they were stopped, but no spoilers, Natasha must deal with her history as a spy and the broken relationships left in her wake long before she became an Avenger. The first film in the Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a bit lackluster in my opinion. Good movie. I probably not delivered the best way that it could have been. Um, suffering from the fact that you know the ultimate outcome of the character, which is kind of alluded to at the end of the movie, it was difficult to get invested in the movie as anything significant to the MCU. Uh, there is some tie-ins that will carry on later on, but you have to watch the, the movie for that. Other MCUs are usually chocked full of cameos uh, of other familiar faces, but they were se severely lacking in this movie. You didn't get any Avenger crossovers or anything that you were expecting. There were a couple of really great points in the movie that it would have worked and enhanced the movie, and you didn't get anything from it. So I was kind of disappointing. Most of the backstory that we do get is done in flashbacks and references, much like all the other backstory we've ever seen on this character. So it didn't seem particularly revealing. All in all, it wasn't the worst MCU movie. Thor, I think, still holds that <laughs> title. But I feel the story could have easily been better. And it could have been told over a six to eight episode arc on Disney Plus like the other MCU shows we've seen. At least then we would have had some more time to explore the characters and experience some real backstory. In the end, it just felt like a final farewell to a character, which cheapened the tearjerker farewell she had in Endgame. One plus side is we finally get to know what happened in Budapest. Or is it Budapest? I, they mm, couldn't figure out yeah. how they wanted to pronounce it. Um, but that was nice. Um, I am thankful we didn't invest the money to go see this at a theater. It's definitely worth a watch, just like everything that's come out so far on Disney Plus, but it's not worth the investment to go to the theater to see it, I don't think. But it's, you know, check it out. It's, it's worth seeing Black Widow on Disney Plus. We'll be right back with our afterthoughts. So what do we got on the on the docket here? Uh, so we have coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, um, Monster Mania Con. So uh, Monster Mania 46 will be August 13th through the 15th in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, then a few weeks later, you have Monster Mania 47, which is in Hunt Valley, Maryland. And then the end of October, you have Monster Mania 48, which will be in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Uh, then we have a bunch of different uh, uh, toy shows that are coming up. Um, the first one, which will actually be a free toy show, which is at a very interesting shopping experience called uh, Carnival of Collectibles. Uh, they'll be doing a small version of a free toy show on Saturday, September 11th. And that's in Cross Keys, uh, on Cross Keys Road in Sicklerville, New Jersey. The same organization that does that also does the Delaware to uh, train show, which will be October 9th. 
and the Oktoberfest Toy Show, which is Sunday, October 10th, and that's at the Neur Shrine Center in Newcastle, Delaware. That's one of our uh, favorite locations to to go to. We, we've we never been to the train show, but we have been to the Oktoberfest uh, toy show many years. And obviously, this is the first time they're back in, in two years. Right. Um, and then uh, we have RetroCon. RetroCon. <laughs> which will be September 25th and 26th. Again, another one that we enjoy going to. And that is also held at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks. And why is it greater? Because they said so. Exactly. <laughs> and finally, uh, the last one th- that we added, which will be um, also at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center, so put that in your GPS and, and save it, um, is BrickFest. So if you are a fan of Legos of any shape and size, this is a, an interesting one to go to. We went to it a few years ago, um, and it was it was really fascinating to see because you have you know beginner level uh, builders putting you know they're putting on display their little creations, and then you have these big elaborate moving parts. Or well, and I'll also say that if you're a Star Wars fan, oh yeah, the displays that they have mm-hmm. are ridiculous. Ridiculous! The detail they have, yeah. like you know, on the on the image itself, you see a Darth Vader. Well, that Darth Vader is life size. Yeah, yeah, you he know. was like seven foot tall. They had star destroyers right. that were that were twelve feet long. Mm-hmm. You know, almost to the point that they were set design pieces for a movie. Yeah, yeah. They had an Attack of the Clone scene that was yeah. an entire like twenty by twenty table. So right. Just to go and appreciate the mm-hmm. artwork of what these people oh, do absolutely. is worth it, plus all the other things that you can do there. As right. Well. So they have different things where you can, you know, help build things. And they they did uh, a couple of different panels of, of different things. And they have various vendors selling, um, you know, older Legos, hard to find Legos, loose pieces of Legos. And if you some like of the... Lego minifigs, this is the place to go because you can get anything yeah, imaginable. Yeah, basically there, there's tons of different vendors selling them um i know when we went they were offering uh time tickets so if you um went after like 12 o'clock or something it was like half price or something And this was before the pandemic right so i have no idea how they're doing uh the tickets for that but that was kind of cool because we didn't know what to expect we didn't want to get there first thing we kind of did like the half day right. thing and that gave us plenty of time uh, you know, to do everything uh, that we wanted to see. So, again, you know, if you're into Legos of any kind, very cool. And, again, just to see the magnitude of, of some of these creations yep. is, is fantastic. Very cool. That was it. Before we go, I do want to once again remind folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get uh, video versions of the podcast listed as Insights into Things. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, any place you can get a podcast these days. Um, We would also invite you to reach out to us. Give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us at Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Or find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. Audio versions of this podcast can be found on the web at podcast.com insights into entertainment.com or you can find us on youtube at youtube.com backslash insights into things we do stream on twitch and youtube five days a week you can get us on twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things if you are an amazon prime subscriber uh, you do get a free Twitch Prime monthly subscription. We'd appreciate it if you subscribe to us there. Or you can find our main website, which has links to everything, along with bios of all of our hosts from all of our shows. And that is at insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.